Hello everyone, I'm Chuck Parson. You're listening to The Life After. So there's this one very essential topic that permeates everything we talk about on this show. But so far we haven't really addressed it directly. The issue is indoctrination. And the reason we haven't really talked about it yet is because it's kind of a hidden puppet master behind the whole system. Indoctrination is so pervasive within religious systems that it's almost impossible to talk about anything on this show without it looming in the background. It makes it difficult to really define and nail down. OED defines it as the process of teaching a person or group to accept a set of beliefs uncritically. Some definitions add the idea that it's often partisan, biased, or controversial, which I find accurate and helpful, but I'm going to take that fundamental definition and expand it a bit. I would argue that indoctrination is the bedrock for most religious belief, or really any belief that points to rigid absolutes. If you aren't convinced that a certain set of presuppositions are true, then none of the rest of the narrative makes sense. In order for Christianity to work, you have to believe that there's only one God, that that God is personal, that it's omnibenevolent, that it's all-powerful, that it interferes or has interfered with the universe we know in one way or another. All of those presuppositions are 100% immeasurable, but you have to accept them before you even start to talk about the creation of the world, the biblical moral code, the accuracy of the Bible. I mean, the existence, the divinity, and the passive acts of Christ are so far down the line of things you have to believe that if you really wanted to be sure of any of them before you believed the next one, you would be long dead before you got anywhere near Jesus on the timeline. What you end up with is a long line of dominoes. Each domino is one of those things you have to believe in order for your religious system to remain whole. Indoctrination is the insistence that you don't poke, prod, remove, or even too closely observe any of these dominoes, because what happens if you knock one over? Piece by piece, the whole system teeters over. I like to think of worldviews that rely on indoctrination as massively high towers that stand on only three or four pillars. For Christianity, for this illustration, we'll say those pillars are the things I listed earlier. A good God, an all-powerful God, a personal God, an interactive God. Theologians have spent millennia stacking bricks of theological ideas on top of those four pillars. And they have built this very impressive tower of beliefs that seems so grandiose that it's hard to doubt its relevancy when you set eyes on it. But what happens when somebody says, hey, what if God isn't actually good? The whole structure comes cascading down. Richard Dawkins talks about indoctrination as a virus, passed between clergy and lay people, between parents and children. The thing I like about that analogy is it sort of points to the fact that indoctrination in whatever form is not usually anyone's fault. No one chooses to catch a virus, and no one chooses to pass it on, it just kind of happens. Every now and then a new virus is created or distributed on purpose, but most people aren't equipped to do that. We just catch it and pass it on. Likewise, most people don't choose to believe things uncritically. It's just what we're exposed to. Maybe our parents taught us, or we desperately needed community, so we drank some pastor's Kool-Aid to fit in. Like a virus, when everyone around us gets it, we get it too. The other thing I like about this analogy is that our bodies are equipped to fight viruses. When we get infected with a virus, our bodies launch B and T cells. These cells are capable of binding viruses so they can't replicate, and even destroying cells that have been infected with virus RNA. Then they memorize the makeup of the virus to prevent future infections. We encourage people all the time in the show to listen to your doubts. Those doubts and that gut feeling you get when you feel like you're being manipulated are our immune systems against indoctrination. We are fully capable of finding those faulty, unprovable ideas, analyzing them critically, and binding and destroying them so they stop reproducing and hurting us and the people around us. Worldviews that don't rely on indoctrination are more like buildings that stretch long and wide instead of narrow and high. They stand on a series of pillars and support beams. These ideas are constructed organically using empirical evidence. And if you take one idea away, you might have to shut down one wing of the building. The structure as a whole stands because it doesn't rely on a few unprovable presuppositions. It's easy to de- and reconstruct beliefs, express doubts, and abandon unfounded ideas because there's so much less damage involved in the process. Critical thinking is encouraged rather than forbidden, and progress is seen the goal rather than the enemy. On today's episode, we're going to talk about indoctrination from a couple different angles. First, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Jesus! Hallelujah! Yes, God! Praise the Lord! Shine, Jesus, shine! We'll talk about how church culture and Christian education indoctrinate kids. Children are very vulnerable. 
to indoctrination because their brains aren't developed enough to think critically about what authority figures tell them. And they don't have the experience to question ideas that aren't sound. Kids have an insane level of neuroplasticity. This means their brains can wire and rewire themselves at a much more rapid rate than adults. And the neural pathways formed at a younger age are much harder to change than the ones established as adults. Kids are also wired to absorb copious amounts of information. They come out knowing almost nothing, and they have to learn just about every basic skill by age four or five in order to thrive in the world. This is why, for example, it's easier to teach a child multiple languages than it is to teach adults. So when you teach a young kid who lacks critical thinking skills, who is going to remember almost everything you say in some capacity about how God created the world and how Jesus rose from the dead, it's going to be a long time before they question that. When they do, it's going to be really difficult to take on because that idea was hardwired into their core understanding of the world. A while back, we sat down and talked with our friend Tim about his experience being indoctrinated as a kid. Well, we were in church constantly. Um, every time it was open, we were there. I mean, whether it was, uh, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday school, God had to get up really early on Sunday. Obviously, a lot of people went through that. Uh, church service, Sunday morning, Sunday night. Wednesdays, um, we went to a lot of the different weekly things that they had, whether you know whether it was like the potluck on Wednesday or whatever. Um, and it, at home, I mean, it was. I, I just I just recently went back to my parents' house for, I believe it was Mother's Day, and I forget how much their house has been just drenched in Christianity. Mm-hmm. There are crosses. Every, everything in their home points to to Jesus. Everything. And you can't look at every book, yeah. every picture. There are crosses everywhere. You know what word, you know, the word that that is like blaring in my mind right now is indoctrination. Absolutely. Yes. And it's, it, it, indoctrination is just like when you take, I mean, literally like as a kid and it's it's so common in in christianity and i think it's i don't think it's it's ill-intending parents i think it's honest people that believe a thing raise your child up in the way they should go when they're old right yeah yeah but it's you're not like you're 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 creating a world where the where the kid isn't isn't exposed to any alternative worldview like there's not like it's christianity as much as possible and there's no there's no chance to critically analyze it or to take in other information and, and well, bounce why, it off of that, right? Yeah, also too, I mean, if you have the truth, why would you need to hear anything, anything else? Anything else, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah absolutely. There, Which mindset, but like looking at it now, you know, it, it looks very problematic. Mm-hmm. So what what places were you indoctrinated? I know you had church. Um, you went there very often. I went to, yes, we were you went church to private school, right? I went to private school. Uh, after third grade, I was pulled out of public school because my mom thought I was getting too popular. And she was like, this won't do. So she pulled me out. So she, and, she thought you were going to end up on a, on a sort of right. your own. So she pulled me out, uh, went to a small Christian school not too far away from where I lived. And I stayed in Christian school except for a three month stint in high school. Cause I was transferring, um, until I graduated. High so you're school. there pretty much. Yes. So you, private school, how, how much indoctrination was there? Like how involved was the Christian um, teachings? Well, I mean, it got less and less. I mean, in grade school, it was very, it was like Sunday school, but with math, you know, mm-hmm. wow. Yeah, pretty much. Mm-hmm. I mean, like it was, it was very small. Girls could not wear pants. Um, you know, you had to have collared shirts, no, no print. It was, mm-hmm. it was very, very Sunday school. Um, I mean, th- it was just real for me then. It was just life. Like I didn't think it was a big deal back then. Mm-hmm. You know, it was just how everything was. We'd have chapel a few times a week. Um, and then it got less and less, obviously. I mean, I, then I went to a Christian school up in a nicer part of town, which I didn't live in a, I live in South County, you know? So like in St. I guess if people are listening uh, who aren't from St. Louis, it's, it's a working class um, Mm -hmm. kind of blue collar Mm -hmm. area. Um, And then I went to like the white collar area for, for middle school and some of high school. It was a much nicer school. There's a lot more money. Um, And I wasn't necessarily someone who, you know, wanted for anything, but I definitely wasn't the upper crust. So it got less and less. Um, There was still chapel like three days a week. 
Um, and I mean, I didn't know anything about anything other than Christianity. I didn't. So tell me a little bit about the philosophy of your home life. Well, um, everything revolved around scripture and trying to honor God. I mean, my name actually means honoring God. That is the definition. But are you? (laughs) It's kind of ironic. It is a little ironic. Um, yeah, I was, I was, I mean, my dad, um, he, I mean, I love my dad. He's a great dad, you know, I mean, but he was in it, you know, Mm. my mom was in it, you know, and they, I, I honestly believe they were doing everything they thought was right. But it got to the point where, I mean, I I remember once in middle school, I had um, some secular music and my brother, who was also really into it. And I mean, everything was guilt. Mm -hmm. You're never good enough. You know, I mean, you always had to had to recheck and make sure that your intentions were pure. When you're a kid and you think that what you're doing isn't good enough and there's nothing you can do it's it's you just you feel terrible constantly it's like it's a terrible feeling um and this was just part of i mean not just your family life but probably also the the church that you were part of right well one of those are fairly interchangeable right okay um yeah i mean since we were always there i mean and i went to uh, awanas as well uh you know and that which which is Approve workmen are not ashamed. It's like the Christian evangelical Boy Scouts, Boy Scouts but right. you don't tie any knots. You just memorize learn scripture. Scripture, yeah, right. that's it. And I mentioned in the first episodes and, where you like earn yeah. the little jewels to put on the little. And then they're like, around. like the the weird thing about it is that like the just kids that were really good at memorizing things excelled at it, and everybody yeah. else was just sort of like a little lost Mm -hmm. yeah i mean that was always and i had a bad home life so i didn't have the parents like helping on a weekly basis so i I actually didn't say enough verses and i was asked not to go for one week no really i was disappointed Uh, yeah i just i liked the iwana olympics that was my favorite i was really good at the three-legged race okay there you go some pride what What up (laughs) what other cultural things do you remember from the church that that may be kind of weird for you or something that that felt foreign to you um so I started out in just like an evangelical free church when I was really young, went to a Bible believing church, which both of those churches are fairly, you stand there, you sing songs, you sit down, you do nothing. That's it. You know? But then I started going to a Baptist church. And when my first, first time I ever went to a Baptist church, people get very emotional. It's very emotion driven. Um, And that's how, that's how they fuel the experience. If you're feeling the spirit, you're feeling it through your emotions. And then people would be like raising their hands, singing and and running down and and praying at the stairs, which they called the altar, Mm -hmm. which I had no idea what that was. Right. Yeah. That's, I remember the, like hearing about altar calls and and being like, what, like, what does that mean? Did you have altar calls where you were from? Um, I did not in the church that I grew up, grew up in, but in, uh, in the church I went to in high school, there were altar calls church. I went to in college. Uh, I went to two different Baptist church and they both had altar calls. So where, where Tim and I went, you had to like, basically if there was an ice cream social, there was the prayer of salvation you know, given an opportunity for people to get saved. Okay. Yeah. It was everything like there, we could not do any service. I remember even being in meetings where people discuss whether or not you need to do it. And and it was always a resounding yes. Right. Always, always be stifling the Holy spirit. You know, there's an interesting perspective from me as a, I I was a worship leader for years and years in, in, in church. And there was this, uh, there's definitely a plan, you know, like it wasn't, like I think for I think for the average churchgoer, there's this degree to which it it might seem kind of spontaneous or it might seem like it's the right moment, you know. Yeah. But there is the song is picked, the verse is picked, the the, the most emotional part of the Every- of the sermon is is what's being said in that moment, and there really isn't. It's emotionally heightened and it's very reactionary. Yeah. Uh, which is alarming to me now. It all it made sense then because it was like, oh well, this is how you get people to the point where they feel the weight of their sin or they feel like they need Mm. to repent or they feel like they need Jesus or they feel like they realize, Oh, this part of my life needs to change. But it's really, that's not when healthy changes are made when healthy changes are made when you're, when you're emotionally stable and you're making good decisions before. Yeah. I don't even even say you can use the scripture to say that if we're, if you were going to build a bridge, you would stop and say, what, what are the costs? You, you want to have like a very um, 
a very sober way of looking at it. You don't want to be swayed by your emotions. You want to sit down and say, okay, if I want to do this, I want to give my life over to this religion or whatever. Um, here are the implications of that. I want to be aware of those before I go into right. also too. I feel like, I feel like someone who's already dealing with a lot of guilt because they've been perpetually told over and over again, what they're doing is not right. Mm -hmm. And then you, then you take the message that has been, you know, over an hour bashed into your brains and then you turn the lights down and you play this beautiful song and everyone is singing and you're for me i was a teenager so like i'm already not certain about my reality in general i mean there's you know puberty and there's a lot of different mm -hmm. things happening mm -hmm. both physically and psychologically and mentally and then you lay that on mm -hmm. and it just it is a very unhealthy way to to just treat people I feel, mm -hmm. well, especially in the tailspin of puberty, you know, there's horrible things that just happen. Your, oh, brain, your brain, your brain just basically mush until you're in your late twenties. I feel, and like. you <laughs> and <laughs> leadership yeah, can yeah, just yeah, yeah. get you to do anything. Brady here. Um, have you seen the movie Inside Out? In the movie, the emotions of sadness, happiness, fear, disgust, and anger all set at the controls of a little girl's mind. They watch through her eyes and they activate when the time is right. When her parents force her to eat a food she doesn't like, disgust pulls a lever. Fear does his job when she watches something scary on TV and sadness when she has to move away from her friends. But imagine a different version of the movie. Instead of the typical emotions at the control, they have a new boss indoctrination. He micromanages how they operate. Instead of watching life through the girl's eyes, he tells them when to activate. I was indoctrinated as a kid, starting out as a toddler. When I was around non-Christians, sometimes I felt fear, because I was told that if I spent too much time around them, they may pull me away from my faith. I also had fear because my indoctrination informed me that non-Christians don't have any morality apart from God. If I saw two men kissing, even though I wanted to be in their shoes, I felt disgust. Sadness when a friend would stop going to church, and happiness when I listened to poorly made shitty music. <laughs> and anger when someone said words like fuck, damn, or hell around to me. But indoctrination doesn't come alone. He also brings his helpers. Guilt and shame. If my emotions didn't line up with the wants of my indoctrination, guilt and shame would step into the picture. But I had to learn to take back control. Instead of my emotions and following indoctrination, I had to give them permission to watch through my eyes again. No more blind following, no more closed eyes. But something else I've seen on the screen lately reminded me of what it was like to be brainwashed to follow and obey blindly. Kellyanne Conway, the mooch, spicy, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, and whoever is doing the job by the time that we release this episode. In my experience of being indoctrinated, it was like someone had set up their very own Kellyanne Conway to systematically tell me how to interpret the world around me. A newsroom was set up in the warehouse of my brain, offering countless alternative facts. The Russians didn't meddle with the election. Non-Christians have no morality. I had my very own personal little gaslighter. And when it would hear the truth, it would scrounge up its nose and gaslight the hell out of the situation. Of course, Noah's Ark is a literal story of real life events. Do you know how many people had to die to get that story to you? And don't you know that believing it in the whole Bible is the foundation of all healthy families? But if I can quote Kellyanne Conway one more time, and this quote rings true for both her and the fictional version of her that lived inside of my head for indoctrination, and that quote is, I'm not in a job of having evidence. Indoctrination makes you throw out what you see. It filters everything you see, honestly. So exactly like those red speckled images in Highlights Magazine that required the red translucent magnifying glass to read, indoctrination causes you to see messages that normally would never be visible. In fact, without that filter, and if you just looked at life as it is, you would never see those messages at all. It told us how to see the world, and it told us how to feel about the world. But the world that I saw wasn't the world that actually is. A little gaslighter in our heads. That reminds me of a conversation Brady and I had a while back. What exactly is gaslighting? 
Indoctrination relies on it, but let's expound a little on what that means. Do you know what finally got me the courage to start doing this stuff? You know what I came across? So before, I was always afraid to tell my story about what I went through and um, it just kind of how everything went down. Because I was brought up in this home with my family where if something that I said happened that they didn't want to have happened, they tell me that, no, that didn't really happen. Right. And they would cover it up and it yeah, would get, yeah. be gaslighting and try to cover up. Gaslighting. And, gaslighting. Yeah. That's, uh, what does that mean? Gaslighting, um, from what I know, and tell me if I'm saying this wrong. Because you got the computer over there. You can, I have a, you can I, Google I, I pulled up a definition, actually. <laughs> I came prepared. This is how, this is how uh, fake our conversations tra- are. Yeah. Gaslighting, www. Yeah, this is all planned out. So We're just reading a script right now. <laughs> we're not even really Chuck and Brady. We're robots. Uh, <laughs> gaslighting is the, the, uh, the strategy of telling someone that their experience is not real. And trying to make them look like they're crazy right. for something that you've done. Right. Yeah. It's uh, how do I pair? How do I? That's good. I found, so um, Oxford, OED. I looked. Um, Friend of mine went to college. Together. To to manipulate someone by psychological means into doubting their own sanity. There you go. I found another definition that's a little bit longer. Uh, gaslighting is a form of manipulation that seeks to sow seeds of doubt in a targeted individual or members of a group, hoping that the targets question their own memory, perception, and sanity. Um, so that was my childhood. Right. Um, and, and I think that's a lot of people's. Oh, yeah. It's very common. Yeah. Um, and it comes a lot with like mental health issues and stuff. If you were brought right. around that, then that's usually a part of it. So I, I went through a lot of gaslighting uh, growing up to where my experience never mattered and it didn't feel... I can't have that experience. And I, I was always afraid to speak out on things because if I did, then I'd be told by family members or other people in my life that no, 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 that's not how that really happened. That's not how that went down. Right. So I went through a lot of that and, and it helped keep me quiet for a very, very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know what shifted it was watching the political climate this year and seeing the election, how yeah. people still continue to, um, for even religious reasons at times, defend trump and other people right this administration is, are like the ultimate gas gas lighters like, and it's interesting to me because the the concept of gaslighting i think didn't really become a, a, a household word until last year you're really. right, 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 right and right. it was right around the time that that the the trump uh campaign really started pushing the concept you know i mean you literally have kellyanne conway going on CNN and saying that, that there are alternative facts. Right. Right. You know, and it's like, that's not a thing. Like facts are, there's only one line of facts. There are not alternative ones. And, and another, another thing that they use is kind of like that, that false uh, manufactured outrage of like, you would say something that's sensible and my response, Oh my gosh, I can't believe you're saying that. Like, no, you're so wrong. You're so to the point where you feel like you're being ashamed or, or looking stupid for saying something that's real right. But because I'm bullying you. I'm manipulating you. I'm, I'm trying to yeah. make you, you look like you're stupid when it's actually me that's doing that. Right. So I saw so much of that within, you know, the political climate and, and how, and not just the Trump campaign. I mean, right. No. You have Hillary Clinton saying that she's always supported LGBT rights right. when you're literally just watched a video of her in 2004 saying that marriage is between a man and a woman or right? my and favorite when she was talking to bernie sanders about universal health care saying oh i fought for this in 1990 whatever where right. were you and it you was hillary care before it was yeah but didn't they show a picture and uh, bernie sanders is literally standing right next to her mm-hmm. while she's giving a speech right. yeah, like yeah, yeah, like, yeah. i was supporting you on that you know yeah 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 but no, it's just so this this concept of gaslighting, I saw so much of it, and I saw that the way that I thought the church leaders and family members or whoever would respond um, is exactly how other people responded to them, and I'm able to see how s- silly they looked. Um, and mm-hmm. then I made the, the conscious decision of that doesn't bother me anymore than that my story matters, and I'm going to tell my story right. and communicate what I think is important. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And it's, it's, it's so important. And I think literally like you're there, there are only, only under very extreme circumstances. Is it, is it okay to accept that your version of a story 
didn't happen. You know what I mean? Like, like right. they're like, like I've had friends that have had like psychotic breakdowns or something. And we have to explain to them that their store, what they think happened didn't actually happen. And then there's proof and all of this. But for the most part in, in, in life, it's, it's, it's not, there are very few circumstances where somebody can actually say like, no, that's not how it happened definitively. And you have to accept that. You know what I mean? Well, how many times is somebody treated poorly or abused and they come on and speak out against it and an abuser comes up and says, yep, that's exactly what happened. Right. That's how it all went right. down. I'm that much of a bad person. Right. No, they're going to defend themselves um, either consciously or subconsciously, but also yeah. they're not just defending themselves of what happened physically, but what their thought process was whenever it happened if their intentions were not to hurt you then in their mind they didn't hurt you they didn't hurt you but if that's what happens that's what happened right absolutely and and uh you know uh, people that are habitual gaslighters typically i think part of the reason that it's hard for uh the abused to call out the abuser is because they know that what that their intentions weren't xyz and so they just sort of accept the narrative that they're giving them because oh well they're a good person um, or like, oh, well, I know them and they, they didn't mean it, whatever. And it's like, no, you have to embrace the story. You know, it's a really big thing for me. And this is something that I learned <clears throat> while I was going through a program. And it's, it was a sentence in this book that I was reading that really stood out to me. Um, that um, you, you, it's never okay for you to tell somebody else how to feel. Wow. And that's like, it, when I first heard that, I was like, is that? Is that true? Like I had to kind of think about it for a while. I was like, never? Like, is that re- is that really true that you can never tell somebody how to feel? Because it's like there are a lot of circumstances where people have feelings that go a certain way that you might disagree with. And, you know, and, and it was kind of a regular part of my life growing up to be told how to feel, whether it was church or whatever other or circumstances. Or family members yeah. or anything like that. And you and 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 i've i've tested it for a, a, a few years now and i i really stand by that you you can never tell somebody else how to feel it's beautiful behavior is a is kind of a different thing like if they're hurting somebody or themselves you can comment on their behavior but how they feel about a, a, a situation you can't tell somebody how to feel about something well two things i think back at back whenever i was a christian there was a lot of talk about like well that's your truth and we'd always discuss how disgusting that was because like oh that's more relativism or whatever um but i think that a lot of times when people talk about oh that's your truth or whatever what they're talking about is that's your perception of how you are feeling and that's what you're you're seeing they're not trying to create an alternate view of what happened or of reality Mm -hmm. but when you talk about somebody else's truth you're talking about their experience and their background and Mm -hmm. how that's interpreting the present etc the second thing i wanted to say was uh, when I was involved in church, I was in, um, in charge of finding people to do halftime devotions for a basketball league at my church. Um, right. And one week I did one and I talked about how it was being brought up in, in the home that I was where, uh, you know, my dad cheated and, you know, we got my parents got divorced and having to go back and forth from house to house and all of that. Um, and I talked on that and a family member came up to me and said, well, it really wasn't that bad of an experience for you. You weren't really, you weren't really in an abusive situation. Um, and it was almost like that family member introduced me to that book. Um, a child called it. Do you know what that is? Yeah. 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 Refresh my memory. Um, somebody, this, this kid was brought up in this horrible abusive home was like kept in a kennel. Uh, Uh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Uh it was almost like that family member planted that. So that could be like the standard from there on out to how my childhood was. It was like, well, it wasn't that bad. You weren't really abused. You weren't, you weren't punched. You weren't, you know, uh, sexually, whatever abused. So it really wasn't abuse, but that, that overlooks the whole idea idea that there is such a thing as emotional abuse uh there really is such a thing as manipulation right. and spiritual abuse within a family is right. very real as well spiritual um, abuse is big it wasn't until i was in therapy that i even realized that that was a term right, right right you know um so i guess what i'm trying to say what advice would you give a listener who maybe has kind of kept quiet about their experiences out of fear of well, it may not um, compare so big to somebody else who I know, you know, went through even worse, or they're afraid of gaslighting or whatever. What advice would you give them? Okay, so the first thing is is abuse is abuse, right? And and it, no matter what the circumstance is, you need to stand up for yourself um, and 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 
get that out of your life, right? I mean, uh, whether it's, you know, there's no, there's no comparing one form of abuse to the, to another. What's the point? I think that's, yeah, that's What does that true. accomplish, right? Because right. it's all about the health of the person that's being abused and trying to get to a point where you can be healthy again and start healing. Mm-hmm. But it, so you have to, you have to fight for yourself, which can be hard because yes, there are, there are social aspects to that, which I guess plays into the, you know, the other thing you said, which is, are, are they afraid of being gaslighted or afraid of social repercussions of, of, of calling somebody out or being real about what's happening in their life? Mm-hmm. Um, and that is what makes it so hard, right? I agree. I mean, whether it's yeah. your relationship with the abuser or your relationship with the church, that you know where you have a spiritual leader that's an abuser or whatever i mean like in your case you 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 called out abuse and you were excommunicated from the church they were mm-hmm. like well no more brady like that's extreme gaslighting and you had to find a, a whole new social life and that's really challenging get um, into it but i think the advice that i would give is your 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 story matters you're not obligated in telling your story if you don't want to mm-hmm. um there was actually Kimmy Schmidt this season has been amazing. And they talk about that where Kimmy is in a situation where um, she's feeling pressure to talk about her story, but she doesn't want to. And the moral of at the end of the episode, she realizes she doesn't have to. Um, right. She is in no obligation because she went through a really hard time to be um, public about everything that's happened to her. But with that said, she is talking to people privately and she is getting mm-hmm. help on a private, on a private way. And I think that's right. so important that if you've gone through an experience that, that is troubling you or has troubled you, uh, be open about it and talk right. about it to somebody that you trust that you know is going to hear. Yeah. You I was going to say the first step is, is finding somebody that you can trust that you can be real with. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt season three now available on Netflix. <laughs> A lot of indoctrination, whether it's intentional or not, depends on the institution of self-doubt. This is where it comes into play in a lot of adult settings, in religious communities and cults that are able to draw people out of self-confidence and trust and into self-doubt. It's easy to trick children into believing whatever you tell them. But with adults, you have to manipulate them into questioning their own ability to reason and understand the world around them. The premise in a lot of these cases is kind of a script where leaders say, you are fundamentally flawed in X way, and therefore you need our special or secret knowledge to be saved, or to fix your flaw, or to be happy. In Christianity, obviously, it's usually something like, you are a sinner destined to go to hell, and you need our guidance to understand the sacrifice Christ made to atone or propitiate for your sins, so you can be saved. Or in less hardcore communities, it might go something like, you have a void in your soul only God can fill, and we have the answer to your hardest questions. But they always sort of drop you into the middle of a narrative without a lot of backstory. It's kind of like how the Star Wars series starts with episode four. The narrative doesn't require you to ask questions about the Force or Luke Skywalker's backstory or why Obi-Wan is good and Darth Vader is evil. They're just implied. In a lot of religious settings, by the time you start to ask hard questions like, how do we know God exists? How do we know he's angry with us? How do we know he's good or all-powerful? Or sometimes more specific ones like, why does the Bible say to stone homosexual men when my friend at work is gay and he seems to be a really good person? Or my favorite barista is an atheist and she seems really happy. Are you sure this is the only way to experience joy? Indoctrination relies on you either ignoring these questions every time they come up, or valuing the answers the institution gives you over your own. Both require you to doubt your own ability to reason and know what is best for you and the people around you. We sat down with a good friend of the show, Jamie Lee Finch, to talk to her about her experience of getting sucked into a cult thousands of miles from home and how she learned to trust herself again after escaping. Yes, so the best way that I've ever been able to explain my relationship towards religion and consequently my relationship towards the indoctrination that you're referring to is um, pulling pulling a little bit from Arrested Development. You guys have definitely seen Arrested Development. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Big fan. So you know the episode where Job gets married really 
quickly yes. to Amy Poehler's Amy character. Poehler's character. Yeah. 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 Um, and they say that it happened because of a series of escalating dares. Yes. 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 That's my relationship with religion. Oh, well, oh, God. It was just a series of escalating dares yeah. where I would be inside of one stream or expression because I was raised Southern Baptist. I was born into a Southern Baptist home. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was Sorry raised Southern Baptist. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad is very deeply committed to, um, being a Southern Baptist, um, still. And so that's how I was raised. And then when I started driving, um, and I did, wasn't really vibing with that Southern Baptist church for a number of different reasons. Um, I started going to the, nearest the closest and I went to a Christian high school too and so a lot of the people I went to school with were a part of a youth group at a different church and it was a non-denominational e-free I guess would be the classification that was a big thing with Tim as well is that he mentioned he just didn't have a way out it was he was at home and everything was Christian he was at church everything was Christian he was at school and everything was Christian there was just like no it's integrated really it's it's oh it's it's your whole life it's every part yeah so I left southern the southern baptist expression and went to a non-denominational expression and then when that one kind of it felt like that one was drying up a little bit and I felt like I was growing beyond it um I left that and then I went to I think it was just a different expression. It was, I think I was going to a Presbyterian church for a little bit. I think I dabbled in Catholicism for a quick minute because the person Mm, I was dating. And, um, and then after the Presbyterian, and and I even surprisingly enough spent some time in the Acts twenty nine kind of that realm. That was my background, yeah. Okay, so the Mark Driscoll that hasn't come nonsense. up on the show at all yet. That's actually a which whole is surprising. Different, yes, yeah. That's a whole different uh, topic we're gonna have to tackle. At some Probably, point, I think. Yeah. yeah. So I, I spent some time with one of those types of churches, and then from that point too, I moved kind of beyond and out of that expression into when I moved to Nashville. So all, I'm saying all this to basically say this is leading up to getting me to Nashville and that's in the where, first place. That's where shit got crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That's where it started to because the Acts 29 church is what I was a part of. And then again, I felt this sense of this isn't quite answering my question, this okay. expression. Um, but I didn't have the permission for engaging the possibility that maybe um, it wasn't answering my question because this in general, won't answer that question. So right. I just tr- kept trying to find expe- expression to another, to expanding another, to another. versions of it. Right. Wow. Um, I relate so, to that. Okay. Yeah. So I went into, found my way into the charismatic expression. And so that's how I got to Nashville. I moved to Nashville to do a ministry school um, with a church here, very charismatic church here. And I spent a year with that ministry school that then uh, so it's a, it's a school you do a, a part of it is you're in the school and you're learning and then you do an outreach. It's, it's kind of similar to YWAM's model in that okay. way. it's learning and then expression of the learning. And so that outreach, I went to England. And then when I was in England working with that church there, I received uh, kind of an invitation, um, an offer on the table to come back and to intern with that church in England, which it was part church and part separate ministry. Um, essentially it was the first European base or first European plant of the international house of prayer, also known as IHOP in okay. Kansas city. Mm-hmm. So this church that we were with was kind of had this corresponding vision, um, that, assi- that was the same vision as the international house of prayer in Kansas city. So by the time that I got to England and the time that I was spending there, I was technically my title. I was on staff at that church as an intern intern, a loose term. I was an intern there and I was a worship leader. So I was essentially singing, (laughs) singing to an empty room for 40 something hours a week was my literal job. You you have to explain that to me because I've never gone to IHOP. I've never experienced that. Right. Yeah. It's part of their model. Yeah. So their belief system that IHOP is rooted in and this international, international house prayer and then house of prayer Europe, they have this core belief that um, it's very end timesy focused. So the core okay. belief is that Jesus is coming back. Um, and that's the greatest thing you could ever imagine is for Jesus to come back. So the sooner we can get Jesus back, the better. And for whatever reason, they believe that they have been given some sort of special vision mandate from God that says the as quickly as you can possibly establish 24 seven prayer and worship on the earth, Jesus will come back sooner. So they have this, 
they feel like they've received this special message from God that basically says that Jesus will come back sooner. He'll come back more quickly if you can establish 24-7, 365, nonstop prayer and worship in certain specific places on the earth. Now, I don't know where they got that from. I don't know. It's uh, it's clearly not in the Bible. I mean, they understand That's not a time thing. zones, right? That there's... I don't think that they do, <laughs> to be honest with you. I really don't think that they do because, the, uh, because having to understand time zones comes at the expense of that prophetic idea or that that working my, that okay work. the rolodex of like my scripture brain that we still remembers everything in my long-term memories like going through and i'm trying to remember what verses can be taken out of context and construed to to fit into this rammed into this there, model well, no that's the thing though is it's that's pointless work because there are no verses there are no this verses is a, this is a special prophetic they got a special thing they oh, got a special right. wow. so mike bickle and then the the pastor ken got it was ken and lois got which ran this place in in europe um has in in england um they believe that they got a special message from god oh my god outside of scripture that says that jesus will come back when there's and now i'm they have like kind of illustrative supportive pieces of text that they use to bolster that idea um and i don't remember what they are at this point to be honest with you but i was in school part of what they do there is you're in school school quote unquote two days a week and they're teaching you all about the prophetic history of why they're doing what they're doing and what's so interesting is that very often dates and details did not match up it was kind of your job to it was pretend just spoken, like, like it did oh my god yeah yeah and so that's the whole the danger i mean that's kind of the bottom of the danger of this stuff is you disengage your cognitive function and your ability to use reason and logic in order to just stay in the club Um, what like what initially attracted you to this place oh yeah so what initially attracted me to it um i think some sense of that series of escalating dares the sense that uh, the way that i had been raised always kind of feeling like the wrong kind of woman inside of Christianity and inside of Christian expression. Um, I felt like my work was to, was to just do better and to keep doing better. Cause I never actually believed any of this. That's kind of the secret is, um, I never, I never, I remember vividly when I was seven years old, just knowing and deeply, deeply knowing that I didn't believe any of this that I was being raised I in. I did too. You know how I always explained it in my mind at, at the age of like seven or eight is I always thought about it as he man. That I'm like, I remember seeing like, I never really watched the show, but I knew He-Man was so supernatural and mm. so weird that I had to like think to myself, like, can He-Man, like this, this weird stuff be real? Um, this is, it's, it's, it's outrage. Like the belief system of Christianity is just as. Right, right, right. It's any other there. fairy it's, tale. The so mythology to, is, is, yeah. is on par with and I did, any story. And I had right. to tell myself like, I, I, I'm having problems trusting and believing right now, but I'm just going to continue doing yeah. it as a small kid. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what, so, so to answer that question of what drew me to it essentially was the fact that it, I never felt it. And I kept maybe thinking that, oh, because there's a garden full of different types of expressions. And every one of those expressions of Christianity tells you that the other ones aren't the full expression of it. So what got me to England was it's just another version of these people saying, oh, well, this is when you're really going to feel it. This is how you're really going to feel it. And I spent 20 years not ever feeling it. Wow. So I was like, oh, maybe once I get here and I do this thing, because they have this language of a sold out vision and they have, you know, people are falling over and people are talking mm. about, and they're, they're feel they have a language for the Holy Spirit and they're really feeling this thing happening and it's very body integrative language which you know we're calling back to and things that we talked about in my previous episode me knowing now that that's my thing and so charismatic expressions which reintegrate a body knowing and a bodily experience of the divine was very very appealing to me coming from a southern baptist background so when i was here not only was that not only is everything i just said a part of it but then also me coming from a uh, not the most solid family relationship. I don't have a very functional working relationship with my mother. Um, and so the, the, the offering of family, the language that this, this community had of that, this is a, it was a very tight knit, very close knit, very insulated That's community so of people. Oh it was God. so appealing. And so eventually what happened with me is when I got there, it's it, the idea of it was very appealing. And then when I got there, my intuition was pinging like crazy. 
and was <laughs> just telling me constantly, like, Jamie, this is not safe. This is not a good place to be. There was a lot right. of very violent language. There was a lot of very militant language. Again, my logical brain, I had to kind of unplug it because <clears throat> dates and times and details weren't matching up. But that felt really unsafe to call that out. When you say violent language. Uh-huh. What do you mean by that? Um, they would actively, there was a mosque that was just up the street from where the house of prayer was and they would actively pray against that mosque and the people in it um even to the to the extent of turning their bodies when they were praying in the direction of it and um i mean they would do the things like they're reading in the scripture uh, that they're reading um calling down fire calling down um call asking their god their one true god to respond appropriately to the fact that these non-believing people were worshiping an incorrect God. And in their scripture, they have all these stories about God acting violently. Their okay. one true God acting yeah. violently to prove that he is the one true God. So they were praying in kind with that language mm-hmm. and and deeply believing that it was appropriate to pray that way. When we've talked before, you mentioned kind of an imagery of Jesus Mm -hmm. coming back in a way. Can you explain a little bit about that? Because that was very bizarre. Yeah, it is really strange. And I had totally forgotten about it until I saw something on, I think maybe on Facebook recently, where someone had brought that up, um, where they were talking about how, um, what they were talking about reminded me of this this realm of theology uh, that I hop in places like it and Mike Bickle himself have, um, where it's a very, it's a very violent aggressive, I would say hyper-masculine idea of the personification of Jesus. Um, so the, okay. the embodied yeah. version, the yeah, embodied yeah. part of the Trinity, um, where they have this, and I don't, again, Rainbow I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm so removed from Christian scripture that I don't know if this is in there or not, and I love that I have no idea anymore. <laughs> but if it is, it's fucked up. And if it's not, it's super fucked up that they just made this up and pretend like it is. <laughs> right. But this image of Jesus coming back as a conqueror and how his, um, I just remember them talking about how his robes were stained in the blood of all of the people that he, the non-believing people that he had slain. Wow. I mean, this place that oh, I was, you have to understand this place that I was, it went so far as to teach. There was a session in the school in, in one of the days for the school that I was in in England. And I could only assume that IHOP does the same thing because House of Prayer Europe did it. Well, where they're talking about, they literally taught us that there's a hierarchy in heaven and that those of us who were on this side of it and had given ourselves completely to this special message that these special leaders had specially received from our special God, that if you're doing this thing and you're completely sold out to this vision, you get to be conveniently, conveniently, the narrative serves themselves, obviously, right. that if we're teaching you there's a hierarchy, the only people that are teaching there's a hierarchy in heaven are the people who are conveniently at the top. So they're, ba- and, and it was some weird shit, man, like some weird language where they're basically saying that this, the way this hierarchy works is you, if you, if you lived in a certain way during your time on earth, you get to be in charge of other people who didn't live that certain way for eternity so once you're like in heaven. believed in like, a grace, but then like the grace was then piggybacked by a works. It was, yeah. you just weren't good enough or it wasn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't put it that way. It was definitely like, you weren't committed enough. You weren't sold out enough. You weren't oh, single minded right, enough. Right, right. You weren't so cat. And they use a lot of romanticized language. So you weren't so captivated by this vision and you weren't so in love with Jesus that you didn't give yourself fully to this thing. Right. You, so we had people in our community in England who were dropping out of law school or who were leaving their medical practice doctors who were leaving their medical practice or people who were, uh, you know, deciding, deferring the option to go to university and to study specific things. And then you also had the shame that accompanied the people who did decide to go off to university and who did decide to do things that were very social, even social justice minded things to try and make our current world a better place. There was so much shame in telling those people that's not what you should be doing with your time because you should be doing this thing instead. There are a couple of, you've sort of already named a couple of them, but I want to, I want to be specific about this. What systems were in place that helped maintain this system of beliefs for, for people that were beneath it sort of, you know what I mean? Like, like you were a victim to this, this system, this system, what made it work? Like what made it, 
continue to Mm -hmm. keep you in. Yeah. So one of the problems that comes kind of in tandem with these, with the charismatic expression um, and this acceptance and this belief in spiritual gifts and in higher giftings is that there is a hierarchy in place there too, where when the nature of a prophetic gifting is accessible and allowed and has permission, then there are people who identify as prophets. And so the problem of basically how that works, the problem with that is you had, or how you kind of keep people in line with that. And what I now see is very much a problem, um, is this, this thing that was a joke when I was in England, um, that, you know, it was funny for us then kind of, but I look back on it now and it's definitely not funny. Um, was this joke that Pastor Lois can read your mail. Mm -hmm. And what they meant by saying that was, well, she's a prophet. And so she's going to have a direct line of access to the divine, a direct line of access to God to know things about you. So you better not step out of line. Okay, You better not even, it's not even necessarily about actions. You better not even think Think. something that is inappropriate or is out of step with the vision that we're good. Because again, their constant language was about being single-minded and totally focused. And they, they were constantly on that, on that, um, and they were constantly communicating that idea of this is what you're on this planet to do. And if you decide to do anything else with your time, if you want to give your life to anything else, um, that's inappropriate, that's sinful, that's bad. And so you have, it's all shame. The answer, the actual answer to your question is the way that they keep people controlled is through shame. But they keep okay. them controlled through shame by instilling this intense amount of fear, by saying that we okay. have the ability to know more about you than you tell us. Because God is going to be, the tattletale right. on you right. if you're not completely sold out to this vision and God will tell us if you're not completely sold out to this vision mm-hmm. and then you're going to get in trouble. And so you, if you, if you take that and add it to the fact that I am living in a different country, um, you're at, you're, you're putting it on top of the fact that I'm only living in this different country, trying to do this thing in the first place to convince myself of something I already don't believe in. So there's the fear of being like, what if they know that I already don't believe in this, Right. but I'm in this other country, essentially only living there comfortably at their will. I'm living oh, off of other people's right. money by Dependency. convincing other people. I've crowdfunded the shit out of this. I've like, I have supporters. Um, so if I don't keep this narrative up, if I don't like keep my head above water as much as I possibly can, I lose everything. Right. And then you add on top of that, the fact that they eventually, after the first few months of me being there and feeling uncomfortable, they broke me down with the family language. Rhetoric. They had this, it's super strange, but this thing happened with me there where the pastors of that church essentially adopted me as their daughter, as their spiritual daughter. Now, I don't have a very healthy functioning relationship with one of my biological parents. Right. What on earth is that kind of language going to do to me? I mean, I'm all in at that point. I'm in because I finally have a place to belong. So all of these things I had been pinging this whole time of my intuition screaming at me and even my physical body being very out of sorts because my intuition is screaming at me saying, this isn't safe. This isn't right. This isn't healthy. This isn't good. That all, you just kind of shut that down because you're like, yeah, but I finally have a family. Yes, absolutely. And then when that is also contingent on, I'm also living in this country and I need this family to help me get a visa to stay in this country. I'm not going to ask questions. I'm going to let Pastor Lewis read my mail. I'm not going to bring up the fact that in this quote unquote prophetic history, you're telling me two different stories with two different dates that absolutely don't match up. Right. I'm not going to say anything about right. that because I desperately need to keep belonging. Yeah. That's the word that keep they, last night when you told us this story, the word that kept, kept on coming to my mind is belonging. Mm-hmm. And it actually like made me reflect a lot. And earlier today you were worried that I was like, what was wrong with me. And it was because I'm reflecting so much on the word belonging. Um, in my spiritual, the the last place that I left, um, the, the last Southern Baptist, uh, reformed church that I left or that disfellowshipped me, it was a situation like that where I had a really, I've had a horrible home life growing up and they were my family for about seven years. Um, there were times where I would shake people's hands and I thought to myself, like, Oh my God, I'm afraid to meet them because I'm afraid they're going to know. Mm. They're going to know who I am. Yeah. There, there's going to be like some weird prophetic word or yes. something yes. that they're going to just have this instinct of, of who I am and what I struggle with and what my weaknesses are. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, 
but I needed to belong somewhere. Yes. Um, and I needed that desperately. And there were times that I had, you know, doubts and all of these things. And I would go and you would ask questions and it would have an answer to it. And you would be satisfied with those answers because you wanted to belong. You know, yes. it, it was enough to quieten your mind down. You talked until... yourself into being satisfied with those answers. Yes. Mm-hmm. But I think we have this idea that like people who fall for cults or go into these weird religious situations, well, they're, 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 they've got to be dumb. There's going to be something wrong with them, you know, but really it's, it happens. I think it that happens. honestly what it is, is the people that end up finding themselves in these unhealthy situations of indoctrination or finding themselves in these cults and in these manipulative expressions are people who are actually very, very deeply in touch with their humanity and mm-hmm. deeply in touch with their needs as humans. And when they hear the loudest, most recent, closest, most definitive, most confident voice that says, I can meet these needs for you, oh, they're absolutely going to run in that direction. It's a survival skill. Yes, absolutely. And so it's actually not the worst things about us or the weakest things about us that got us into these situations with these people that manipulated and abused us. It's actually the best things about us and the strongest things about us and the deepest and truest things about us that made us made us susceptible to being drawn into these unhealthy expressions. But what it does is it rewards people that have the ability to shut their mind off Mm -hmm. and to get into the cycle of it and once you're in the cycle right. of it, you stay in the cycle of yes. it until you say, whoa, 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 whoa. And then you have to go it out. The word right. rewards that you just said, I think is really important to that is it continually rewards the people who are, yeah, just asking less questions and are disengaging more often with their own intuitive sense and their own intuitive knowing. They, it is constantly rewarding with verbal affection it is rewarding Mm -hmm. with opportunities for leadership it's rewarding for um it's rewarding with platforms um with notoriety it's rewarding those Mm -hmm. people Mm -hmm. that assimilate to the rules as best as possible with this idea this this continually perpetuated idea of success of what success looks like within the system itself and it's continually propping up those people so it's it's cyclical it just it it never stops you mentioned social justice earlier that Mm -hmm. people that care about social justice they get put in positions where they can do more of those things yeah and because social justice is a good thing in and outside of of a belief system they think well i'm doing a good thing so obviously i'm in a good thing mm-hmm. right. what were you gonna say chuck um so the thing that that stands out to me and both of you guys are sort of sort of saying in your different experiences is this idea of a prophet right so like it's sort of a i guess for lack of a better term it's sort of a deus ex machina it's like this mm-hmm. like it's like this, uh, when, when the church, when the cult, when the church, when the community is in a bind, it's like, oh, well, what did that guy say? Because mm. he has a direct line to God and he, sure. has, he has yeah. special revelation that we don't have. Yes. And, uh, it's sort of, it, it's, it's like people become prophets and I've seen this like over and over again. It's like, this person's a prophet. Well, wait, how do we know that? Well, that guy said that he was a prophet and yeah. he's a prophet. Yes. I was like, well, how do we know that? And, but if you, if you don't question it or if you ha- have had an experience that makes you feel like, oh, these people actually, these people do know, like mm-hmm. they tell you something intimate about your life or, or something that's meaningful to you. And then suddenly you're in because you think, uh, they they told me this thing that was true, so they must have more truth. Yes, right. And mine look different. And then and then it and then they use that to manipulate circumstances. The yes. Bible doesn't doesn't really matter what the Bible says at that point because they're the one dictating sort of how the community works, what you're supposed to do, what this person's supposed to do, what your relationship is to this, what work are you supposed to be doing, and it and, and it they can use that for literally anything, anything. to manipulate mm-hmm. manipulate Absolutely people. Anything. Yeah, and I feel like mine was a little bit sneakier about it because mm-hmm. we would reject anything that was not in the Bible. Like our mm-hmm. definition of a prophet is somebody who knew the Bible well, and so it had to do more with the interpretation and the ability to teach on it. Whereas like if we had like an extra, oh, I have another, I have another message from the Lord, we would reject that. But what it came down to is people who still had the ability to do what you're saying, but did it in a way where they were able to take different contexts and put them on different ways. Um, and then it became like very personal counsel of, well, you don't need to reject counsel. Um, the Bible says that you need to have all this advice from all these people. So we're going to give you that advice. And so that's mm-hmm. how it became 
prophetic. That's how it became the word is because That's it sounded as if it was coming from the Bible that we needed this mm. wisdom. God gave the wisdom to these people. And so now they're sharing it to us as, a, as an advice giver. That is so fascinating because for the expressions that I was a part of in the latter years that I spent mm-hmm. inside of Christianity, basically what I'm referring to with Grace Center and with this community in England, that idea of that being what the prophetic means our idea of what the prophetic was and what the prophetic means is totally different. Right. So even in and of itself, like prophets yeah, and yeah, the yeah. prophetic have totally different, there's totally different options for how you interpret what that means. In But the end game yourself. is the same. The end game is the same. The end game is fear and shame and manipulation. And, and that's no what I want to touch what. on is, uh, so we talked about rewards. Let's talk about when you start to push the system a little mm-hmm. bit, um, like whenever I was disfellowshipped, there were people from the church who came forward and they're just like, we don't think Brady should have been disfellowshipped. What's going on here? And they, they would give this answer of like, well, in our private meetings with him, he was being disrespectful to the Lord and he wasn't listening to the council and all this. And then wow. they accepted as an answer and they walked away. Mm-hmm. And so wow. it's like, you know, I you you do push these boundaries yeah. because we do have sense and there are times where our logic mm-hmm. the way that i described doubts when i was a christian was like is that my logic came up from under the ground or underwater and came up for breath before i was able to just be like okay i need to push you back down mm-hmm. but in the back of my mind i'm hoping i hope you don't drown i hope that my my logic is not yeah. going to be gone forever yeah. um and it did come back up and that's how we're here but when you do push those boundaries, um, it's not just in a reward system. There's there's a punishment system. People are going to turn mm-hmm. against you. Um, the the families and the people that that told you that they cared about you and that their family slowly kind of start ignoring you, um, and and things like that. Uh, what experiences did you have in that area? Well, um, my situation was a little bit specific. I I remember a few years ago when I was giving this. The, this entire story, the whole rundown of start to finish of what my experience was inside of all of this to a friend of mine, their very simple point blank question to me was, how did you get out? And mm-hmm. my only, my answer to that, my only explanation for how I got out, um, is it just sort of happened to me? Um, it was very practical. So, you know, just recalling the fact that I was a part of this cult, a part of this unhealthy community in a different country. And I was there uh, living for, as an American, you can be in the UK for six months, uh, up to six months without a visa, not one day more. Um, And then from that point, you have to go back to America and apply for a visa in order to to come back. And so I left that community in England um, with the full intention because once they got me, once they hooked me with the family language for the last couple months I was there, I was all in. And I was like, this is my future. This is everything that I want. This is what I exist for. And so I came back to the States and fully intended to spend three months here seeing family and friends and traveling a bit before applying for a two year long visa to go back there. And my intention was to just renew that visa because I mean, I cannot stress this enough. I totally believe that I was going to spend the rest of my life in that community right, doing that right. thing. So I came back here and when I came back to the States, I left half of everything I owned in this whole world and my closet in my flat there. I didn't even say goodbye to anyone because I was like, hey, it's cool. I'll see you guys in three months. Right. So it was like a, just a subtle see you later. So I came back here and two months into those three months of being, being here, I received an email from some of the leaders in that church pretty casually telling me, hey, um, so we miscalculated some finances and we don't have enough money to bring all of the people that we had promised to bring back as full-time interns, like all of the Americans that we promised to bring back. We don't have enough money to bring you all back. In fact, whoops, we don't have enough money to bring any of you back. So, um, so I got this, I mean, I got this, this email saying this to me in May of that year of 2014. An email. An email. An email. Right. Yeah. My family sent me an email. This was the direction of your life. And now here's an email. Here's an email. You. It's like a breakup text saying, from your mother. We don't really yeah. know. <laughs> yes. It's sort so of, it's yeah. saying, no, we, really, yeah. whoops, uh, we can't do this. Um, and it literally said, check back with us in October and maybe we'll know more about what we're working with financially. No practical, how are we going to get your stuff back to you? No. Oh, they had zero. That was not on their radar at all. No, like, oh, how are you going to eat? Where are you going to yeah, live? I had. I was homeless. I was jobless. 
I, so at this point I'd been living off of other people's money. I was living off of missionary support for six or seven months at that point. Um, I had absolutely nothing and it was so casual. And the sentiment of the email itself was basically that the further manipulation is, well, if this is what's happening, this must be what God intended to have happen the whole time. So have fun figuring out what obedience looks like for you in this situation. So all the other decisions that we made up to this point, saying they're God's will, we're obviously... We're not going to say that we're wrong. We're just going to... No, they weren't wrong. We're just going to ignore it and then yeah. just move forward. Their whole... I mean, it's very much just... Wow. This is this must be what God wanted the whole time. So there's no space for me at all. The point of me saying all this mostly is for me to communicate that there is no space for me to validate my own emotions in receiving an email like this. Because if you if I react, if I'm upset or angry and rightfully so, the response to my emotions of what they just, the information they just told me would be, oh, hang on, you're not being obedient to this vision. Like God has a plan here. God's doing something here with this and God must want you in America for a little while. And so it's your job to figure out what he's doing. It's your job to put this puzzle together. Meanwhile, we're just gonna keep doing this thing. Now, combine that with the fact that for six months, I had been on the receiving end of constant communication that my life literally had no purpose or meaning apart from doing this work with these people in this place. Mm. And I had let that, I had let them, I had let that narrative do its work inside my own head. Mm -hmm. And when I got this email, It not only was a very practical, I don't have anywhere to live, I don't have any money, and I don't have any plans about what I'm doing with my life, but it was also, if this this is the only thing that I am apparently here on this planet to do, and everything in my life has been leading up to this point of doing this thing, and I literally can't even, I'm not even allowed to step foot in the country that I was supposed to be doing this thing in, everything completely fell apart. Everything. So <laughs> the church community that I was in, it was normal to have like six or eight kids. Everything was about have as many kids as you can. Dear it God. was all about getting married. The day that we were engaged, you know, there was church family saying, oh, when's your, when, when you have the day planned? Because um, they believed in very short engagement and then you get married um, because you don't want to burn with lust and you want to just bam, 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 as fast as you could. And um, on top of that, you know, I was... (laughs) So make children. Yes, that's what it's all about. Yeah, and so, yeah, they they don't come out and say birth control is wrong, but by practice, that's very much what they believed and what they practiced. Um, And my my spiritual gift, you know, I thought was preaching and teaching and and I was told that that's what I would be doing for the rest of my life and that's what I was encouraged to do. So my degree is in and and all of this, I had all this support in it. Um, But the moment that like I got divorced, that all went down the window. I mean, they couldn't even trust me enough to stay inside of a faith community. How the fuck am I going to be able to lead a faith community faith attached community. around these right. people? You know, right. so it's like, yeah, you 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 lose the game, and you are just thrown out. And then instead of talking about it, sweep under the rug. Yes. Mm. Um, because we don't we don't want to talk about that narrative where what we promise the people and what we teach just doesn't actually it doesn't work. deliver i did everything i could have done to save my marriage yes. but they had to tell the narrative of well brady's not doing yeah anything. until i call, called him out on that and three months later like okay you're right you did everything you could yeah and it's like yeah you you don't just get to rewrite history and the story to fit in the guidelines of what you're wanting to teach because you're so incredibly indoctrinated that you think that it's true and you want to indoctrinate other people to believe that it's true. Mm -hmm. That's not how reality is going to work. And I think that's why it's so important for people like you and people like me to stand up and say, we're not doing this anymore. Um, we want Mm -hmm. people to hear the stories. I don't have shame for falling for it. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I I needed a family and they were my family Mm -hmm. for that time. Mm -hmm. I love, still love some of them. Um, but the belief system is not something that I can, I can support or believe anymore because what is there, what is there to pay if you, if you rebel hell, Mm -hmm. how, I mean, you get tormented for a little bit. No eternal damn fucking nation. And it's outrageous that that is the yeah. stakes of what well, you're going to believe in what we have for, with no proof 
no proof and no no evidence outside of our book to say that the book is true. There's no proof or evidence. But if you don't believe it, if you don't get into the circular reasoning, then there is literal hell to pay. Yeah. And and that started how old were you when that you started hearing that shit? Well, I remember I remember it. I have a lot of strange, vivid memories from when I was seven, because um, I remember the specific house I lived in at the time. And so I remember being really, really, really afraid of the idea of the afterlife at that age. Um, but what's so interesting to me is that I would, I would um, every night when I was trying to go to sleep, I would cry most nights um, because I would just have little seven-year-old existential crises. And um, I would cry for one of my parents to come in and, and talk to me. And I would want them to tell me over and over and over and over the story of heaven and hell and Jesus and God and what all that was. Mm -hmm. And I needed them to tell me that story night after night after night because I needed to listen to it night after night after night. Because what I vividly remember that I was looking for and trying to listen for was some kind of loophole where I could latch onto that and say, oh, see, th this is why what you're telling me isn't accurate and isn't uh -huh. applicable to everyone. Because what I was terrified of, what was keeping me up at night and keeping me from going to sleep at night what I was crying about is that I had been told that I was going to live forever. And the idea of living forever sounded terrifying. And unfortunately, from when I, ha I would have my parents tell me the story, the stories over and over, and I would express in my braver moments that I was terrified about the idea of living forever. And I think that they thought I was afraid of hell. And so they, in their efforts to comfort me, they would say, oh, you don't have to worry about going to hell that's not where you're going to go because there's Jesus, a, there's always an answer because heaven, because, Oh, yeah. you're going to heaven because you believe the right thing. But the thing is, is I wasn't afraid of hell. I was afraid of heaven. Wow. My fear, the vivid images I had of the fear that would keep me up at night as a child were vivid images of heaven. Cause I didn't want to be there because the, the, the guy who had thought up hell in the first place lived in heaven. Right. I didn't want to hang out with him. I wanted to be as far away from someone who would think up that idea in the first place as possible. Because well, apparently, it's so fucked up. It is fucked up. And apparently as far away as you could get from that guy is hell. But you can't opt out in that narrative. You can't opt out of one or the other. And I just remember thinking like, can I just not exist forever? Can I just die you when I is, die? Did you ever watch the, the Saul movie? Really, yeah. It, the Saul movies where he puts these people in these impossible situations mm -hmm. where they either oh, had to like right, right, right. dig a, a key out of yeah. their yeah. eye yeah, yeah. or kill yeah. somebody. To, yeah. And so you're, you're thrown in these. And, and what did you do to get in these situations for humans? You're just fucking born. You're just existing. You're born. That's why I keep needing to make the distinction between Christianity and evangelicalism or is because right? fundamentalist yeah. evangelicalism is the fact that Christianity is its own potentially life-giving expression of belief and story mm -hmm. and fundamentalist evangelicalism is a team sport so it doesn't have to matter to you <laughs> that's a really good way to put it yeah it doesn't team. have to matter to you right. that there's millennia of people who are burning forever in eternity because you're not one of them you're not on the team wow well, you're not on that team so it doesn't have right. to matter to you yeah. so when you're asking people for some sort of explanation, when that matters to you deeply, and you're asking someone who is inside of that narrative, some someone in leadership to explain to you what to do with that logic, they don't have an answer for you. They're never going to have an answer for you because it doesn't matter to them. Because the as long as you're winning, as long as mm -hmm. they're winning, mm -hmm. they don't have to be concerned with the right. ones who are losing. And they'll pay lip service to it and they'll talk about evangelizing and they'll talk about that. But, it, but even that is its own weird team sport with tally marks and you know a lot of numbers. That's Soul really line. it. You're just keeping, keeping track of numbers. My, my advice, get out of the system. Get out of the cycle. I can see the world a lot more clearly now than I ever have before. Um, and I... I hope that people are able to either find non-toxicity within their religion or to just get out, get out. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that it is, um, yeah, I think that that is good, um, advice and that is a good compass to, to point you in the direction that people need to go. Um, but when you're dealing with people who, um, on a very base level, on a very, uh, when their needs are being met, 
when their basic fundamental human needs are being met by assimilating to these narratives, it's not as simple as that. It's not. You well, can't I, just I didn't want to make out. it sound simple. It's not. Yeah. It, it's a very, it's a very long process. And, and for me, it was the inciting event was the fact that I literally couldn't get back to this place that I desperately and deeply wanted to be. And so in my, you know, trying to rebuild my life and start over being here in the States, it gave me some space of permission because of that distance, um, where my, and my body started reacting in some really strange ways, trying to go back to the church that I had been a part of. And I was having panic attacks when I would enter the building and I couldn't be in the building for more than a minute and a half because the residual effects of the trauma yes. that I had experienced yes. in England were coming up. Right. And so what I ended up having to do was give myself the permission to stop going to church every Sunday and also every Monday and sometimes Tuesdays and Thursdays. Right, right. Um, give myself the permission because I was f- having a physical reaction. And so the distance, that space, like I've said it before, I'll be the first one to admit that my initial inciting event of, of leaving that narrative was born out of a response to pain and a response to abuse and a response to manipulation. But once I was on the outside and I was in this larger landscape, all I experienced there was a a deep inner knowing and a confirmation of this is where I was supposed to be the whole time. So that pain and that that abuse is actually what kind of like got my butt out the door. And once Mm -hmm. I was out, because I had to take care of myself, Mm -hmm. I had to take care of myself because of what happened. And once I was on the outside, I was like, oh, this is where my answer has been the whole time. But I just never had the permission to leave. The reality is that indoctrination is just plain hard to deal with. It causes this duality in our minds where our senses and our reason, the tools we use every day to survive, the tools that make the most sense, that help us do our jobs, to put food on the table, interact with our peers, manage our money, constantly at war with what we've been told by someone that we trust is true. Often your gut is telling you that it can't be true and that it has to be true at the same time. My advice, if you're wrestling with this, take a big step back. Move away from your church or religious institution if you can. Give yourself space to ask hard questions. Trust yourself and don't undervalue your ability to reason. If you really don't think what you have been taught is true, don't be afraid to take it all apart and start over. It's scary. I've heard this story hundreds of times now and I can say with confidence, it will be the best thing you can do for yourself. Thanks for listening. Thanks to Tim and Jamie for contributing. This has been another episode of The Life After. And remember, if you don't go to church, Sunday is just a second Saturday. Thank you for listening to the Life After podcast. We are committed to create and provide free resources for those who have left or are leaving toxic religion. We often suggest professional therapy. Please subscribe, rate, and review us. Visit our website and blog at thelifeafter.org. We also have a Facebook page and secret Facebook group at facebook.com thelifeafterorg.